Hey, what's up, everyone? Sam Shaw here, founder of Wall Street Mastermind. Really excited to be here uh, today for, with uh, another client interview for you guys. Um, today, uh, we have Jagger on. I'm really excited about this interview because uh, Jagger is just a total rock star. And uh, he just, you know, finished going through the uh, summer 2023 recruiting process. And uh, sorry, summer 2024. Summer 2024. He just finished going through the summer 2024 recruiting process. And, uh, you know, was able to um, land a really, really good offer uh, and really just finish his recruiting process early. Um, I mean, obviously could have kept going and uh, had a lot more interviews lined up, but uh, got an offer that I was really happy with and uh, was able to wrap it up. So uh, I wanted to get him on here and just talk to you guys about kind of his journey and his experience. And, um, you know, I'm sure he'll shed a bunch of insight along the way that will hopefully help you in your own process as well. And, um, you know, just hopefully inspire you guys uh, in terms of, you know, what's possible. So uh, first of all, Jagger, thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. And if you don't mind, uh, maybe start things off by just introducing yourself real quick, like give us a little bit about your background and uh, just kind of like where, where, you're, where you're coming from uh, as a candidate. And then uh, we'll kind of dive into some follow-up questions from there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And thank you for taking the time. So um, kind of just like some background on me. Um, originally from LA, I came to New York. Um, originally was interested in media and entertainment. Um, and then once I was in New York, uh, came to NYU, really started getting interested in finance. But at NYU, uh, which is generally considered a, a target school within banking, uh, a lot of people don't realize that it's mostly the business school, Stern, that's the target school. And I actually wasn't a part of that. I was, I'm in, or was in liberal studies. Uh, recently switched to Stern, but that was post um, post my recruiting process, actually. Um, so uh, once I was yeah, gone to NYU and I, everyone kind of around me was really obsessed with banking, try to get I started to get a lot more interested uh, in it, but I didn't really understand how good my chances were, um, was do, trying to do some did a lot of stuff outside of school. Um, but I kind of saw everyone around me, especially within the business school. Um, and didn't really know how my chances chances stacked up against them, uh, specifically with these kind of top tier firms. Uh, I would say I was generally pretty confident in myself that I would be able to land a job in banking, but I wanted to kind of land in a, like a top bull bracket or elite boutique. Uh, so that's kind of where um, where I want to be. Um, and as kind of the process like began, um, I didn't really necessarily feel like super confident that I was able to navigate it as well as I could, I felt there was a lot of things that I, I was missing, even though I was being able to take a, some finance classes and do some things outside of school. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. So let's, um, let's work backwards. Let's start with, uh, like what offer did you end up with, um, that, you know, made you decide, Hey, I'm going to stop recruiting. Like what, what was the outcome? I guess. Yeah. No, absolutely. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I got an offer from uh, Perella Weinberg, which is an elite boutique, um, and uh, signed quickly after. Um, and the reason why I kind of want to be done with the process and want to sign uh, Perella Weinberg, um, even though I had a lot of interviews lined up, there were other firms, mm -hmm. once I told them that they said they could expedite the process for me, I'd see a lot of super days lined up with other elite boutiques and bulge brackets. Um, the reason I really want to sign was because I, I know culture is kind of very cliche, especially when you go through the recruiting process, every single firm goes and they say, we have a great culture. We have a great culture. But I, I think for me, the way I think about it more was my, the connections I was able to make with the people at the firm. Um, they were really helpful to me kind of throughout um, whether it be on the junior level or senior level. Um, and they actually made a big effort uh, to kind of show that they really wanted me uh, even expediting a lot of my interviews and this is not when I had I didn't have another offer at this point um mm. speeding up my super day uh kind of giving me an offer essentially right away um and then congratulating me after like many of the senior members um both who interviewed me and who were helping me through the process um kind of reaching out to congratulate me those types of things uh really matter to me especially because you want to think for me it's like I want to be at a place where I'm not just thinking of uh like how big is the name but how of experience i'm going to have there thinking about group placement and everything else after um so those things were all really important to me so after like a lot of discussions uh with you sam and with with some of the other coaches uh, i realized the best option for me was the best thing for me was to sign so you're saying they accelerated your interview process even though you didn't have any other offers yet like they just did that 
proactively, basically, not because you force them to. Yeah, no, I, I did not reach out to them about uh, speeding up uh, anything at all. I, I So I had my first round um, pretty early in the process, like I, in, before a lot of, I know people who are interviewing with them now in the first round. Yeah. Um, and for the super day, I had to pick like a time slot, which I, I picked because I wasn't, uh, I wasn't in New York at the time, even though it was going to be in Zoom, I wanted to be in New York. Um, I picked a later time slot and they actually like called me and asked if I could do uh, a time slot within the next two days, um, which wasn't even a listed time. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, like I said, they were really helpful after. So it, it, all these things kind of, uh, they did have a lot of weight for me and kind of in my decision making process. Yeah, that's. That's amazing, man, because, you know, usually it's the other way around where like we we know a lot of students who um, like maybe want interviews with these elite boutiques or these both bracket firms um, and they've been networking and they don't have interviews yet. Um, and they're like trying to get an offer from somewhere else first, just so that they can take that offer and go back to these firms and say, hey, I have an offer. Can you accelerate my process? And a lot of these and sometimes like even students that have gotten offers and then they go and try to accelerate the process. And then the firm's like, Oh, we don't care about the offer because like, it's not on the same level as us. Like, especially a lot of elite boutiques. I think like they, they tend to do this a lot. It's like, Oh, you got an offer from where? Like <laughs> SVB. Okay. Like, well, like that's not like, if you get an offer from Molis, come back and let us know, you know, like, like that, that that's more on our level. Like, so they'll do stuff like that. So like we, we don't, it's very rare for us to see firms, um, proactively accelerating processes for candidates and, and also like for them to accelerate the process for, for candidates, like just cause it's more work for them, right? Like they have to like for HR, they have to go, they have to like find bankers who are available to interview you. And it's just like, this is a lot more of a hassle on their side. And so they don't really want to do it unless it's someone that they feel like it's worth doing it for. So I think that says a lot about, um, I mean, you must have done something right, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later in this interview. Like, I'm sure people are wondering, like, well, what the heck did you do that, you know, made them almost like come after you so hard? Like, that's really what everyone everyone w w w would die to have, right? It's like, usually you're chasing these banks, but if you got the banks chasing you, then I think it's a t totally different ballgame, right? Yeah. Um, what were some of the, like, other opportunities that, you had, cause you said you had lined up a bunch of super days and then obviously you decided not to go through with them. And so you're just like passing on them, but like, what, what were some of the other opportunities that you had? Yeah. Uh, without kind of listing the, the specific firms, I mean, you can probably guess some by this description. Yeah. Um, like if I would say like several of the top four, three or four, um, bulge bracket banks, mm. um, as well as like a couple of the like elite boutiques, uh, within that category, um, as well as some of like the higher middle market banks um, and a couple of specialized um, banks like focus on a specific uh, certain industries. Yeah, um, so, yeah I, I was I had whether it be like super days, second round, like and also some uh, private equity firms as well. Mm, OK, I mean, that if I count that up, that's that's like between five to ten banks, really, yeah. like or five to ten banks slash PE firms. So that's a lot. That's a lot of interviews. Like, obviously I'm sure, I mean, if you really went through with all of these, you probably would have gotten multiple offers and, and then, you, and then you could have, you could have picked or whatever, but I mean, Perel is a great firm. And so I think like the, especially how, based on how much they want you, I think like, um, that, that, that's a great, that's a great outcome. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So that, that was the outcome. Now let's go back to kind of the beginning of your story. So uh sounds like you really because I think you joined Walsh well, Mastermind like beginning of sophomore year. If I'm yeah, I joined in the like September like either the end of August or beginning yeah. of September. Yeah, I think it was like August. And so it sounds like you kind of got exposed to banking maybe during your first year at NYU, which probably everyone does because that's just what NYU is like. Um and so like what were you doing for like, you know, IB prep prior to Wall Street Mastermind, or like, I'm sure there's a bunch of resources on campus, there's clubs and things like that, that, you know, a lot of people try to join, like, did you try to do stuff like that? Like, walk us through kind of like, pre Wall Street Mastermind, like, what were some of the things that you were doing, if anything? Yeah, no, absolutely. So 
um, kind of on campus, I was trying to get exposure to as many different clubs as I, as I could. Um, and then, so those would be kind of, we have like IB clubs, we have private equity clubs, um, different investing clubs, trying to get that type of exposure. Um, some of them are kind of free, like any member can join. Um, some you have to apply to get a specific position. Um, and then I realized what I, I kind of felt like I was going into a lot of these positions or applications with a lot of confidence um, mm -hmm. because I, I thought I had studied a lot of a lot of the stuff that they were looking for. Um, and I was realizing in some of these clubs, I wasn't even getting an interview uh, for for these positions. Um, and that was kind of a, a big moment for me um, because, yeah, if I if I can't get an interview or I can't get one of these positions in these clubs, then what what then how good necessarily are my chances um, with uh, with some of these top banks and a lot of people could say oh because you're a freshman or oh it could be connections or anything like within the clubs but there's all these other factors that also play in, into banking uh, to getting an internship in banking mm -hmm. getting offered so uh, that is something that uh, I like really stood out to me and then in terms of kind of what I was trying to do work experience I had some internships in, in venture capital um, just trying to get a first couple um, kind of first experience in finance and did a program in the UK kind of doing some training for different finance roles like uh, sales and trading uh, asset management and IB and while the IB kind of training was was great um, like learning how to do more financial modeling um, I came to realize and that that's not necessarily what is necessary um, to get an internship or that's not they're not testing you on your financial modeling ability Mm -hmm. um in any of these interviews so then as it kind of came uh to the start of sophomore year um uh, i realized how, how big of a component in the in the process networking was and i felt like i was kind of lacking on that more uh even though maybe i knew some people within different banks i i, I didn't really have a good process of being able to effectively network mm -hmm. um didn't really know what that looked like um so that that was one thing that really kind of drew me to wall street mastermind um gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, that makes sense. So did you, so you ended up not getting into any of these clubs then is what you're saying, or, or did you end up getting into some of them or? Yeah, I got into uh, yeah. So I would got into, got into one, which was a more of an investing slash consulting. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other ones, I uh, did not get like a position within them. There's still like open meetings to attend. Um, but yeah, did not have a lot of luck within that. Gotcha. Okay. So basically Long story short, NYU has a bunch of feeder clubs and, but like you didn't really have access to them for the most part. So you couldn't like rely on that basically. Um, yeah. Do you think like that's just due to the fact that like you weren't in Stern or do you think there were like other factors that kind of prevented you from like having more success with those club applications? Yeah, yeah, it can be a variety of things. One, I mean, I think the fact it wasn't Stern was definitely some some a, a factor because they are Stern clubs. Um, but ov obviously, that can't just be the only factor. Only um, there's it could be stuff that my resume wasn't good enough. It could have been how it was laid out. I wasn't able to answer questions for like the IB club of why I want to do investment banking enough, which is a question that a lot of investment banks ask you in interviews. Um, wasn't necessarily doing the right networking for the some of these clubs, which is also important for for investment banking. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just so that that's what you were alluding to earlier, which is like a lot of the same factors that determine yeah. your success in investment banking recruiting also determine your success in club recruiting. And you almost just viewed this club recruiting process as like a like a not like a trial run, but it's almost like 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 a, a precursor to what's about to come. And then that kind of gave you, I guess, like a reality check of where you thought you were initially and where you actually were. And then so you're like, okay, I have more work to do basically to really get to where I want to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. Cause on top of that, I heard like everyone talks about, yeah, target schools, but there, besides the fact that it's certain versus non-certain, a lot of these banks have a certain amount of spots reserved for a school generally, like obviously it varies, can vary by year. Yeah. Uh, so you're much more, you're honestly, in my opinion, much more competing with the people at your own school. If you're at a target school, than just like all the people applying to the bank. Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of really demonstrated that I need, I need to do something more to kind of, um, get to the place I, I want to be. Mm. Okay. Um, 
So basically you're just saying, cause this is a really good point that you're bringing up actually, because a lot of students will think like, well, I already go to NYU or I already go to Columbia or Warden or whatever, like filling your blank with the name of a target school. And then they're like, well, since I go to a target school, then like, I don't need help. Right. Because like so many people in my school get into banking anyway, so it should be fine. Um, I think to your point in reality, it's like, I would say two things. One, there's as, as many kids as there are from NYU that get into banking every year, there's for sure even more students from NYU that wanted to get into banking, but didn't. Yeah. Right. Meaning like, you're not going to tell me that the majority of the students at NYU that want to get into banking are getting into banking. Like, yes, they're on an absolute basis. There's more students at NYU that get into banking because it's target school versus a non-target school. But like percentage wise, like I would say, you know, it's still harder to, uh, it's still hard to get into. So like, there's still, it's, it's still like, you know, a select, a small select group of minority that's actually getting these jobs. Right. Cause like you said, there's a quota. Um, but then the second thing too, is like, I feel like a lot of times for target school students, like even for you, for someone like you, like, I feel like someone with your level of intelligence and your level of resourcefulness and like your work ethic, like, I have no doubt that like you maybe like, oh, I mean, we don't know. This is like a, you know, alternate universe and we'll never know what happened. Like, this is not Dr. Strange, but like, like you very well could have gotten into banking on your own, even if you didn't join Wall Street Mastermind. Right. But the thing is like, I think a lot of the, like, I would say like 45% of our students in Wall Street Mastermind come from target schools. And a lot of them are like really, really qualified. And then like their mindset that we've realized uh, when they join Wall Street Mastermind, it's not because necessarily because they're like, oh, if I don't join Wall Street Mastermind, I'm not going to be able to get in. Their mindset is more like, hey, like, even if I could get in, like, what's my floor and what's my ceiling right now? Like, there's a range of outcomes. And like, how do I raise the floor and the ceiling, right? Yeah. Like, if what you see in my ceiling is now my floor, like, I'm not just getting into banking. To your point, you want, you were aiming for, like, the best bulge brackets and elite boutique firms. That was the, that was the goal. Right. And like, honestly, at that level, like no matter how good you are, it's like, you can never be overly confident that, oh, I for sure will get there. Cause like, there's a lot of other really qualified students at your school who are also going for gunning, gunning for the exact same jobs. And then it becomes like, okay, if there's a fixed quota and there's more, there's more students that want these jobs and the number of jobs actually available, then what's my competitive advantage over everyone else that goes to the same school as me, right? To your point, like they're actually your primary competition. It's not like the people from the other schools, right? And then to your point, like not to mention if someone of a lot of these students that you're actually competing with from NYU, maybe they are in the feeder clubs. Maybe they have those resources and they have like the alumni network of that club that they can tap into, which you don't. Then it's almost like you're, you're actually at a disadvantage already from the get-go. And so like, how do you level the playing field against those people, right? Yeah. And so it no, sounds like that's kind of like how you thought about it. Yeah, no, that that, that completely that's completely true. Um, just so I needed to figure out because I mean, like the point you said before, I, I knew I had an extremely strong work ethic and needed to find kind of different ways to to um kind of level the playing field. I I think I even mentioned in our like onboarding meeting um when uh, it was either with you or one of with one of the other coaches when they asked me um like what do you want to get out of this. Um, I, I think I was even told that I had a strong chance of getting into, uh, into banking. Like you weren't, you weren't saying, oh, you have no chance. Like you, you, you were all very up, uh, upfront with me and saying that I did have a good chance. Yeah. Um, but I, I was, I talked about how I want to increase whether like even having a good chance, I want to increase that by whatever it is, five, 10%, 15%. Right. Uh, in addition, making it so that my chances of getting a top tier firm were higher. So the same thing where you're talking about like the floor versus the ceiling, kind of raising the, ch uh, raising the percentage chance of getting that and also raising the chance of getting a top tier firm. Um, because getting into banking is a very wide, um, like a wide kind of category. Um, and, yeah. uh, and as you kind of continue to go up, there's even more and more competition, both from everyone, but also within the, my own school. Yeah. It's like, I think sometimes people don't realize like, it's like, I just want to get into banking. But how do you talk about getting into banking? It's like, if you get into a top 50 bank, it's like maybe like a middle market bank, 
this is not the same as getting into like a top 20 bank, like a both record early boutique, uh, boutique bank, right? But then like even getting a top 20 bank, like is not the same as getting into a top 10 bank or a top five bank. Like and when I say like, it's not the same, I just mean like in the big, at the beginning of your career, it's not going to feel that different. You're going to feel like, Oh, like I'm pretty close to this guy. Like, Oh, I work at, I don't know. I was not to pick on anyone. I work at Piper Sandler and this guy works at Goldman Sachs, but we're both investment bankers. And so it's like, you know, not that different. We make about, about the same amount in base and same amount in bonus. But then it's like, they have better exit opportunities than you do. And then so like that gap starts to widen over time. And in the beginning it's not very noticeable. And then like over time, as your career progresses, you find that gap widens and then you're like, wait, wait, what, what just happened? Like, why, why is that guy progressing so much faster than I am? And so that's why I was like, I always try to, because I'm like almost 37 now. So like, I'm a lot older than you guys, right? Like I've seen, I've personally experienced this myself where like, I look at my peer group that I went to college with. And then you, we look at like where we ended up 15, 20 years later. And when you look at everyone's careers, you're like, whoa, this guy's doing way better than that guy. And like back in college, like they didn't seem like they were in like totally different leagues, right? But like you compound that over 15, 20 years, like that's a long time, right? And so like for something this consequential, right? For something that can have this big of an impact on your life and on your career, it's like, it's better to say than sorry. Like you don't ever want to have the mindset like, ah, oh, no, like this is good enough, right? Because like, what if, it, what if, what if it's not? Or what if like, you fall short just by a little bit. Like, is, is is that really worth like, you know, leaving that up to chance? I would say like the risk reward profile is just not there. Right. So I think like the way you thought about it is really, really smart. Um, now let's talk about like, so that was okay. Mindset coming in, obviously. Now, sure. obviously you've been in Wall Street Mastermind now for, Ooh, like, I mean, you were probably in, in it for like six or seven months until you yeah. got the offer, right? So like, talk about some of the things that you did after you joined Wall Street Mastermind. Like, how did you go about the recruiting process? Like, what did you feel like were some of the things that really had a big impact or helped you the most and like got you to where you are today? Yeah, so yeah, to kind of start off, when we, I kind of joined the program, in one of these, in one of like the first modules, uh, kind of within it, okay, which is kind of more of how to like mentally prepare to kind of go through the process. Uh, like a phrase that really stood out to me within it is, is a healthy parent paranoia. Mm. Um, and that really stuck with me. And that's kind of how I, I kind of kept that mentality going through it. You don't want to kind of go be overwhelmed by the amount of stress, even though it is a very high stress situation. But you do want to have a certain level of either stress or pressure because it is so consequential. And you want to always feel like you have to be doing more. And, and I think that that the program kind of and everyone in it kind of instill this hunger to kind of continue to push and push, whether that's not just for interviews, but doing stuff throughout throughout the school year um, to kind of continue to better ourselves. So what I found so rewarding within the program on, on two fronts, one within the actual community, within the Wall Street Mastermind, like I was able to do not just, you don't, uh, not just kind of working through possible interview prep, but actually getting to do a lot of great, having a lot of great experiences. I did case competitions with some of the people in the program. I had just hour long phone calls with or zoom chats with a lot of the people in the program who now I consider really good friends, yeah. just kind of talking about our experiences throughout the year, just joking around, having that sense of a support group, uh, going through uh, that something I felt I had an even stronger bond with and kind of shared experience with the people in the program that I did. It was like even some of my friends, um, at school. And then so that really made it a lot more uh, kind of easy going through the process, whether that's, uh, yeah, again, like I talked about mock interviews or kind of any possible question that we would have, either someone, another kid would answer it or you or one of the coaches would. Um, and that was all super helpful to me. The way the program was structured was also um, like amazing to me because I was really stressed about the amount of time I would have uh, to kind of prepare. Um, because when I started to kind of look at whatever these, before the program, these guides online, uh, I, I knew I would be able to um, maybe understand or memorize it to a certain extent um, by a certain point. 
but I want to really understand the concepts. I, I didn't really feel that because I, the way I like to think about it is I want to do well in the interviews. I want to get offered, but I want to kind of actually be able to understand everything yeah. uh, and really kind of develop. And so I didn't think that was the right approach. And the program was structured in a way that I could kind of go through the year, do school, also do internships outside. Um, and it was done in a way that it made sense. And each concept kind of built upon the last. It was also extremely helpful in terms of networking. I, I mentioned before how I didn't really know how to network. Mm -hmm. And in the program, it gives you like really great instructions of how to network really efficiently. A lot of people think, oh, networking is just sending a bunch of emails. But it's really important to actually boost the conversion rate of those emails. So one that implies it's how how many how often people respond to your emails. How often does that turn into actual calls? How often do those calls actually turn into referrals? Uh, all of these things can change the math from you having to send three thousand emails to you having to send a couple hundred emails. And it shows you how to do it in a much more effective way. And on these calls, like making sure you actually are able to build a connection with these people. Um, so that they remember you. And I, I truly don't think I was able, would have been able to do that uh, outside of Wall Street Mass Mountain. Like even in some of these like prep clubs at, at my school, um, I wasn't kind of getting, they, they might teach some technicals, but they didn't really demonstrate the networking component that well. So mm -hmm. it, it, I feel like overall really kind of helped me uh, in the process um, to kind of be a more confident person when I was engaging uh, with all these bankers and have a lot more success. Um, so I can kind of dive deep, deeper in any of the kind of aspects of the program that you, that you want, that you want to ask about, but like overall, it's just, a good experience. <laughs> I mean, there's so much goodness there that, um, that you just mentioned, like there's so many different directions you can go in, but I think that, um, you know, on the networking side too, I think like, you know, before we, uh, kind of hopped on this call too, you were also just telling me a little bit about, um, all the success that you had at like, you know, a lot of these info sessions and whatnot. And I think also maybe this is a good time to sort of go back to my question from earlier, which is like, you know, we talked about how Perella really wanted you and to the point where they were like proactively trying to accelerate you versus like the other way around was usually you trying to ask, beg them to accelerate your process. Like, what do you think it is that you did that made them behave that way? Because we know for a fact that they did not do that with everyone. Right. And also like there, there are other people um, in Walsh mastermind right now that are, like you said, that are going through first round interviews as we speak, whereas you already finished going through the entire process and got the offer like, you know, two, three weeks ago. Right. So like, what, what do you think it is that made it so that they treated you differently? I guess. Yeah. No, absolutely. So kind of, I would go to all of these different sessions, whether that's in person um, or online sessions, some of them were NYU specific, some of them were online ones, I really carefully followed all the different websites of the banks, making sure I was stayed up to top, uh, up on date, up to date on all of them. Also in Wall Street Mastermind, people would send around different um, kind of info sessions that were happening with different banks. So that was also super useful. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, People kind of think like, oh, you go to target school, you have all these different bank sessions. Oh, it's easy to network with these network and get your name um, in the door with all these banks. But um, if you go to one of these target schools, you probably uh, kind of have a similar experience where you go to the, one of these info sessions. There's probably like five or six bankers and there's hundred, if not, if not a, like either a hundred or potentially multiple hundreds of kids all there, all suited up and ready to kind of surround the bankers. Um, basically like <laughs> sharks. Um, and so it can be, it's an intimidating environment, um, especially it's, and it makes it especially hard to kind of leave an impact. Um, so after kind of like going through the networking modules and kind of talking to a lot of people, talking with Sam, uh, I really kind of realized the importance of confidence within these sessions. So what I started to do in a lot of these sessions was if it was in person, I would go and I would sit in the front. I would stop being like anxious or worried about uh, like, how how anyone would react um and just kind of make sure i was the first person asking questions make sure i would ask the most questions uh kind of in this kind of circle surrounding the bankers make sure i continue to speak with them stay stay with one person who i, I thought uh, i really wanted to talk to um kind of continue to talk to them throughout the entire session uh try to follow up with them and, and i led to a lot of like a very high conversion of me getting 
uh, like further phone calls or meetings with very senior people, whether that be MDs, partners, um, and kind of being able to continue that. Uh, meanwhile, I saw a lot of people who, again, were all very smart at my school, had great finance backgrounds. They would go to these sessions um, and they would think, oh, because they signed in on on the registration, then that's good enough. And they would send the back and not really paying attention, mm. but maybe go, maybe ask one question and leave. Um, this was even more so online. And a lot of these online sessions, most people had their cameras off. People weren't really paying attention, even if there were some very senior members of the firm um, kind of there. So this really kind of, I think, what allowed me to stand out the most at a lot of firms. And it's what made me get a ton of referrals at a lot of these places. Some places I even got to skip rounds without even asking. Um, and it, it made it kind of, it made it like, I think it made me seem like a much more desirable candidate um, to your point before, um, in the sense that they, they can actually see me in person or online, um, really trying to kind of interact with them and really show my interest. Um, and I feel a lot of people are just too anxious or they think that what they're, they, they're going to say is going to sound dumb or they don't want to speak up in front of a lot of people, but you have to be able to overcome that kind of sense of insecurity um, to kind of be able to succeed. You have to push yourself um, to really be able to succeed. Um, and I, I th again, I think that a lot of the people I talked to within Wall Street Mastermind would have like a similar opinion on that. Yeah, I think basically what it sounds like if I really just try to sum it up in one sentence is just like, you just out networked everyone else around you, <laughs> basically. Like you did a really, really good job networking, but not like the superficial type of networking, which I think a lot of people do, especially at these target schools. Like everyone, everyone at your target school is networking, right? Everybody knows, like everyone, every kid at NYU understands you got to network. So everyone's doing it. Everyone's like sending out emails. Everyone's reaching out to the same alumni. Everyone's hopping on these calls. But like, I can tell you right now as a former banker, like most of the people, most of the students that I've networked with, I do not remember. Like, I mean, first of all, like most students are just not that important to me personally. And like, I'm super busy and I got a bunch of work and have my own life and whatever. And like a lot of these conversations is just like boring. Right. And like, and I was like, a lot of these kids, like they ask like all the same questions, like it is the same canned 10 questions that everybody maybe found online somewhere on some website, God knows which one. And then they just like all ask the same boring questions every single time. And that's what you do if you like don't want to stand out, right? No Versus doubt. like for you, it sounds like you were, you really found a way to stand out from other people. You really put yourself out there. You really, um, you know, had like long, meaningful conversations uh, with, and, and also I think the other really interesting that you mentioned is like, you weren't just networking with a lot of people. I think they just network with like the really junior people, right? They just network with like the analysts because you know, those guys are like the closest to us in age. Maybe we even knew them because they were in the same club as us. Like they're the most accessible. They're the, we have the most in common. They're the easiest to talk to, whatever. Right. And then so like, I know so many students out there that just like only talk to analysts the entire time throughout the recruiting process. And it's like, that's not going to be as effective as like, versus like someone like you, who's something like you did a lot of networking with like managing directors and partners and like really senior people at the firm, like you talk about like letting you skip rounds or like accelerating your process. I can guarantee you, like there's almost no analyst out there that can make that kind of stuff happen. Like there, there, there just isn't right. Like they don't have that kind of um, influence, but like if someone really senior really liked you and they're like, we got to interview this guy, like right now, we got to interview this guy before you know, the other firms interview him. We got to give him an offer before the other firms give him an offer. Like, and that, that's not even just getting you the interview. Like if they're doing that to get you the interview, you can be sure that they're also like talking to whoever interviewed you afterwards to be like, Hey, how did this, how did this guy do? Like, I really like him. Like we should give him an offer. Like they're, they're making things happen behind the scene. Right? And so like, I think like, cannot understate the importance of of networking, I think like, you know, and again, everyone understands like, yeah, it's important, but it's just like in terms of what it can really do, if you approach it the right way, like it, it can, it can be an absolute game changer. Right. So yeah, absolutely. Like, I think there's so many people who are very obsessed with studying the technicals, which are important, but 
if you like without really great networking a lot of these top firms you're not like you can have a great resume i had a great resume i know people who had other friends who had great resume like especially as i went through my sophomore year i have friends who have great resumes and but didn't really focus on the networking component and they weren't getting interviews um mm -hmm. um at places that i mean i think in terms of qualifications they probably should um because they weren't kind of as focused on these networking sessions yeah I mean, honestly, if you go to a school like NYU or you go to like, you know, Warren, Columbia, whatever, any of these schools, like so many kids there have great resumes, like yeah. having a great resume is literally in those types of environments, having a great resume is just like, that's the bare minimum. That's just like, that's just like, if you don't have that, you almost like, there's nothing else to talk about. You have that. So does everyone else, you know, your technicals. So does everyone else. Right. And then so like, what else is going to set you apart? Like, it really comes down to your networking. And then I think also related to networking, it comes down to um, your behavioral answers and like how you're able to tell your story. Like a lot of times in these networking conversations, like a big part of how well the conversation goes and whether, you know, the banker ends up wanting to refer you after your initial conversation comes down to like, if they like your story or not. Right. Yeah. And I think like people put so much time into the technical prep. And I know so many people that like barely put any time into the behavioral prep because they just think that like, Oh, behaviors are easy. Like you just talking about yourself. Right. Like, yeah. They think that they think that there's no wrong answer. And that was kind of the mentality I had before joining the program. I was like, Oh, I just need to get my technical. It's like, Oh, I can talk about myself. I can say a story that, Oh, there's not like a wrong answer. Um, but a lot of these places, like, especially if you talk to senior management, like what the, a lot of them place say that the most two most important things that they're asking are, are uh, tell me about yourself and why why this bank or why investment banking yeah. um because they, they at the end of the day they want like they want to work with they want to be with people that they actually like um the technicals in many of these places some places it gets harder but um a lot of places are more like check the box um and the behaviorals are what when you're in an environment like nyu your environment like michigan ross or your environment like penn or warden the technicals, there's not really much differentiation. Everyone, a lot of the people are at the same level of technical, like and, uh, how advanced they are on the technicals. It's what the behaviorals and then the networking part that really sets people apart and is what results in interviews and then potential offers. And I mean, like, if you think about it, right? Like, even if we talk about like Perella, like if we just talk about their process, like first round, you know, it's with Dartmouth partners. It's pretty much all behavioral, right? If your behaviorals don't stand out, you're not even getting past that, right? Yeah. Um, and so your technicals don't even really come in until you get to the super day, right? And, and the, super, the super day was only for technical. There was four interviews. Only one of them was technical. Yeah, exactly. There's like four interviews. One is technical. Um, and also like, well, like if you if you think about who your interviewers are typically, right? Um, you might get some more junior interviewers and you might get some more senior interviewers. And then who typically does a technical interview? The junior, junior folks, right? And then who does the behavioral interviews? The senior folks, right? And then after the interview, after the super day, what they do is they all get into a room and then they all discuss the candidates. And then like, who do you think, whose voice do you think matters more? The analyst or the MD, like the MD, right? Like, like if the analyst loves you because you're like, oh, so good at technicals and the MD hates you is like, Sorry, no go, right? Like if the analyst doesn't like you and then the MD is like pounding the table for you, like the analyst, what he's going to do is he's just going to STF you and like be like, oh yeah, no, I think he's pretty good. Like the analyst is not going to like put his own career on the line and go against what the MD wants just to be like, no, we shouldn't hire this guy because he messed up on this one DCF question that I asked him, right? Like, so like oh, no, no one's going to do that. <laughs> to your point, I actually messed up a technical question in the technical interview, but I crushed like the market like the behavioral and fit questions with the senior people and yeah. uh, i got offered so it's like that's one of those things where it's like if you can really leave an impression it can it can outweigh um like a, a technical mistake but and we see that yeah. we hear that all the time from yeah. our students is like we we have so many examples of students that were not perfect on their technicals and still got offers but we've never seen an example of a student who like nailed every single technical, but was just so-so on their behaviorals. And then they got offers like that never happens. Right. Yeah. So I think like the reason why everyone's so focused on technicals is like everyone's been conditioned, unfortunately been conditioned to think that technicals are like the end all be all by 
all of these companies that sell resources that cater to the technical interview, right? Like financial modeling courses, interview guides, like all these things are heavily focused on just the technical aspect. And the reason why it's focused on technical aspect is not because it's more important. It's because it's easier to teach that stuff, which has like a, a an exact right or wrong answer. Like I can create a technical guide and give it to everybody and it's just one size fits all. And I only had to do, do this work one time versus if I actually wanted to help you craft really, really good behavioral answers. I don't have a one size fits all template that every, every single person is not like, Oh, I just say these things. And then like, you, you're going to be great. Like it has to actually like match your background and story. And like that, that's where like, you need that human touch like that. And, and that's where like that, a lot of personalization um, has to happen. Right. Yeah, no, completely. Um, awesome. So man, I feel like we can go on for a really long time, but uh, I want to be cognizant of, um, of your time, obviously. So like, let's, let me just ask you one last question. Cause obviously okay. you had a lot of success and I think to be honest, you've already given a, a ton of really great advice, but is there anything else in terms of like any last words of wisdom or advice that you want to pass down to like younger students who are maybe still recruiting now, like maybe someone who, you know, a similar profile as you, like maybe they, you know, attend a target school, but maybe they're not like at the business school. So they're not really target. Like the kids that go to, you know, NYU, but not Stern or Michigan, but not Ross, or I don't know, Berkeley, but not Haas, right? Like whatever, like maybe someone who's going through the process now, like, is there any piece of advice that just you picked up along the way that really made a big difference for you that you want to kind of share with other people to help them out? Yeah, I, I would just say kind of at the end of the day, like investment making is not for everyone and you need to do some like soul searching kind of as you're going into this process and realize if it's something that you really want. Because I, I feel that to have success within the process, obviously there's exceptions, but I think generally like you have to be very kind of hungry. You have to be very driven for the outcomes that you want. And you're going to have to go be up, above and beyond not just like in school, but whether that be like with internships out, outside of school to kind of beef up your resume, whether that's doing uh, continued technical studying or prepping your behaviorals and mock interviews, the networking can be a very exhausting component, um, but you just have to be able to continue to push through. And so it, it's a lot and it's, it's, it's a lot and you want to have a good kind of support network around you for that. But to do that, I think you really need to evaluate kind of in the beginning, talk to people and see if this is something, is this something you want to do because people at your school just want to do it? Like, is it because it's really talked about? Um, or is it something that you, you really want that outcome, that you're, that you're really driven about it? Um, because uh, again, like I said, in order to success, you have to be really hungry for it. Um, I think that's really good advice. I mean, this is what I tell people like, yeah, like really get clear on your why, right? Like, why do you want to do this? Because I know so many students that are like, oh yeah, I want to do most making because to your point, like everyone around them is doing it. And they're like, yeah, this sounds like the cool thing to do. And then they don't really have like a good reason for why they want to do it. And then like, inevitably, as they start going through it, they're like, holy crap, they kind of realize you know, this is so much more work than I thought. Or, wow, this is so much harder. Like I keep getting rejected. Like what's going on? Or, oh my God, I'm emailing all these bankers and no one's responding to me. Like, or where I'm getting all these networking calls and they feel like they don't go anywhere. Like, what's the point? Why would I even keep doing it? And so like a lot of people, like they end up dropping out or, you know, halfway through and giving up. And like, not that that's the end of the world, but what happens then is you end up wasting a ton of your time and effort and energy um, when you could have just, you know, saved yourself from going through all that pain in the first place. Right. So yeah. um, with something, with, with a job this good, with something this desirable that so many people want like it's really really hard uh, or it's not supposed to be easy right it's gonna be hard and so you just have to make sure that it actually is something that you really want badly enough that's what i thought oh to put oh whoa sorry i was serious <laughs> it's okay uh, you have to make sure that that's something that you really want to um put yourself through that right and make sure that you're actually like really not going to give up like even when i was recruiting back in like 2008 i had to go through so many rejections like for full-time recruiting like i didn't get a return offer because i interned at bear stearns and that was the summer that everything went went to shits and like i had to recruit for full-time without a return offer which made it super hard especially 
I was like, a lot of people say, oh, market conditions right now are so bad. I'm like, oh, you guys haven't seen nothing. Like, like market conditions back then were way worse. And, and, and like, I probably got rejected by over 20 firms before I got my first offer. And I was like, so many people would have given it up after like the fifth or sixth or eighth or 10th rejection. And so like, at that point, like, okay, this is not for me. Right. And the only reason why the only thing that was like different from me and them wasn't because I was smarter wasn't because I was harder working. It was just like my reason for why I wanted to do banking was a lot stronger. And I was like, giving up is not an option. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so a lot of that is just like, who's the last man standing type of thing, right? Um, obviously, it wasn't the case for you here because you got an offer way earlier than I did. But I'm just saying like a lot of times that's what, what it's going to come down to. So I think that's really, really good advice, um, uh, especially for most people. Like it's going to be a struggle, right? Um, but with that said, like, if you guys want it to be less of a struggle, uh, if you guys want to make this a little bit easier on yourself or like, I mean, to be honest, we can't really make the process easy, but we can make it simple, right? Simple as in like, we can take the guesswork out of it. We can take the trial and error out of it. We can like tell you exactly what you need to do, how to do it, what order to do it in and like when to do these things. Like, but obviously you're still going to want that has to like have a good work ethic and go out and execute on those things. But like, if you want to simplify the process and if you want to like raise your floor and your ceiling and you want to like maximize the chances of you getting the best offer possible because you understand how consequential it is. Then I want to encourage you guys to reach out, schedule a call with our team um, so that we can learn more about your current situation and what it is that you actually need help with because every single person is different. And like, if we can actually help you, then, uh, you know, we'll walk you through kind of like what we think the game plan needs to look like based on your current situation. And that's different for everyone. Right. But like, if we um, can't help you at a minimum, we'll like, you know, tell you why we don't think we can help you and just give you some advice on, what we would do instead if we were in your shoes. But either way, like, you know, it'd be a really valuable call for you guys. Um, and, and, you know, our goal is to just help as many, as many people as we can, regardless of whether they actually work with us or not. So um, if that's something that you guys are interested in, you can go to www.wallstreetmastermind.com slash apply. Um, the street is abbreviated to ST. So it's wall, ST, mastermind.com slash apply. And uh, we look forward to talking to you. All right. So with that said, um, Dagger, I want to thank you again for um, taking so much time to share your story with us. I think we've been going for, gosh, almost an hour now. And so um, we're going to wrap things up here. But uh, before we do, just want to congratulate you again on, you know, a great offer. Uh, obviously, you crushed it with recruiting. So super happy to see that. Um, and I'm just excited to see what you accomplish um, going forward, uh, both in terms of your summer internship, but obviously also full time and beyond. So um, congratulations again. And, uh, thanks for letting us just, you know, play a small part in this process with you. No. Oh, yeah. And thank you so much. It's, it's been amazing. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we're going to be out in New York, uh, probably hopefully at some point this summer uh, and do another event. So hopefully I'll see you there. Yeah. again. I know you were able to make it last time. Um, but if not like, you know, don't be a stranger. I'm sure uh, we'll talk a lot more. So absolutely. Cool. All right, guys, that'll be it. We're going to wrap it up here. And, uh, you know, thank you guys for tuning in. And we'll be back uh, with more of these for you guys in the near future. All right, thanks.